Welcome to Females and Fine Fettle, from Wiped Out to Wealthy. This is where conscientious women entrepreneurs and women living like a boss come to learn about balancing their personal and professional wellness with ease. If you have the enthusiasm, motivation, and grit to make it happen, then listen up every Monday. To be sure you don't miss an episode, sign up for weekly updates at femalesandfinefettle.com. The following discussion is for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease. Please don't apply any of this information without first speaking with your doctor. Now, here are your hosts, Denise Pasquinelli and Dr. Michelle, your natural women's health advocates who blend the wisdom of ancient healing traditions and the science of functional medicine. Hey there, and welcome back to another episode of Females in Fine Fettle. This week, we interviewed a super creative entrepreneur named Marley Grace. She is an improviser and writer who lives in rural California. She works with improvisation as a method for navigating being alive and making work through movement, quilting, writing, and podcasting. She also facilitates classes and events for her own work and for others. And she loves to help other artists and humans (laughs) unlock what is blocking them creatively through one-on-one creative mapping sessions. She's also working on a book called How to Not Always Be Working, which is a spiritual and practical toolkit for taking breaks and really loving your work and your life. And that book comes out in the fall of 2018. So welcome, Marley Grace. So we can go ahead and get started. Great. Welcome. I'm so happy that you're here on the show. Thanks. Happy I'm, to be here. I'm glad. I'm so glad. I'm a fan, a big fan. <laughs> and as I had mentioned to you, we are, we try to have different themes for our podcast. And this month's theme is about creativity and play okay. as it relates to health in mm-hmm. general. So you came to mind right away as somebody who has really integrated that the act of creativity and the opportunity to play with with practice Mm. into life. And I know that for you, it is something that has supported your health and your mental health in some ways. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited to chat with you about all of this today. Great. Me too. Awesome. So I guess I'll just say I for for any of our listeners who don't know Marley, I first discovered you through your Instagram account, Personal Practice. And I love I just loved it. I think I loved the simplicity. I loved the fact that it was consistent and it was playful. Mm-hmm. Um and I think I also love that you had called it personal practice which is something yeah. that I know I and I think um, many of our listeners really crave and you made that feel really accessible mm. by doing it every day you know by showing up yeah. um, and I also think that there's a quality to the videos that feels like it was very much for you mm-hmm um, and that just feels really good to watch, I think. And I, I've been thinking about that a lot. I recently listened to Elizabeth Gilbert's book, uh, Big Magic. And one of the things that has stuck with me from that is her advice to do creative work for yourself mm-hmm. and not for someone else. And if it's really for you, it, it will likely draw people in. Um, but if you're trying to make it for someone else or some other purpose, it it isn't necessarily going to do that. And I don't know, I've been turning that over a lot and I feel like your exam, your, your work is an example of that feeling really like truly for you. And Mm. I don't know if it, it just feels like there's a, a very sincere presence in the work and it's really savory. But I think it's also kind of tricky in the age of social media, which is in some ways obsessed with doing something maybe for an external win. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that there's definitely the opportunity for offline connections. And, and I'd love for you to speak to this, but um, there's, there's an interesting dichotomy there. And I know that this is something that you're thinking about right now mm-hmm. a lot, like that intersection between the power of social media and the challenge of social media um, and, and how it can support working offline. Mm-hmm. So and that's my little introduction to you, but I would love for you to give us a little bit of a sense of who you are and what you do and who's Marley Grace. Great, great. <laughs> well, yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for, I love, you know, I love hearing how people find me, how they interact with the things that I make and. Yeah, I mean, I identify as a a writer and a dancer and a public space curator. That's sort of what brought Mm. me into the mass, into the social media masses maybe was a space that I ran in Michigan for many years called Have Company. Um, And then, yeah, after I was running that space for a few years, I started personal practice almost exactly three years ago in Mm. July of 2015. And yeah, I mean, what you, excuse me, what you said is exactly accurate. I made, I made personal practice very, very purely for myself and, um, also an Elizabeth Gilbert fan and Mm. big magic listener. (laughs) And I remember hearing when I was listening to that book and she was I think in that part, she's mentioning like writing Eat, Pray, Love and Mm -hmm. saying, you know, I I just wrote that book for myself. Like I had to process that. And so much of my interest right now is sort of in that, like, why do we make things? How how do we make them both online and on the Internet? And, um, you know, one of the most impactful books I read this year was your art can save your life by Beth Pickens. And, Mm. you know, she talks a lot about if you're an artist, you have to, you have to make your art. There's not, there's, um, there's not another way. And I love that, you know, that's, it's how I, it's how I process the world, you know, whether it's your job or your job is, is sort of irrelevant to the sort of requirement of showing up to your practice. So Yes, personal practices for me, it's a pure fluke that tens of thousands of people watch it every day (laughs) or, you know, fluke, maybe it's the wrong word, but I, yeah, I learned a lot about my process too from my little brother who's a musician and, you know, has had little moments in his career also that are sort of like so many people watching what he's doing. He has a a project called Radiator Hospital. It's his band. You know, he makes, Mm. you know, punk tapes in his bedroom half the time. But it's, you know, that then get like four star reviews in Rolling Stone magazine. And, you know, he Mm. doesn't have a booking agent or like a manager. He's just like a punk who lives in Philly. And, you know, it's kind of that same thing. Sam talks about, you know, he makes songs for himself and and then you know there's obviously this maybe light hope that other people connect to them but sort of released from the expectation of how many people or what what the result is but this sort of necessary action of writing them and making them for yourself so Mm. yeah that's that's a little that's a little intro snippet about I love it I love it I Given that it was a fluke or maybe a surprise, <laughs> yeah, um, did that affect your daily practice in any way? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's no, you know, there's no denying that. I mean, from the beginning, part of the, you know, there's a compositional practice after the composition practice, which is, you know, I'm dancing, I'm improvising, I'm choosing a song. And then while that's happening, I'm also, you know, sometimes there's no thought. I'm like, okay, this is where there's a ledge to put my phone on. That's what people will see. But a lot of times, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm performing. It's a, it's a small, there's small performances really, you know, Mm -hmm. they're not just practices. And so that's, you know, kind of a intersection that I'm 
always looking at is, you know, some of the videos really are just me. They're all of me practicing, but, you know, there is or in the the trimming and the cropping of the amount and, and the time that I'm showing someone it is its own mm-hmm. tiny composition of like, yeah, I'm, I'm presenting something to, to whoever. Um, but again, it's like, I'm usually just p- presenting it to myself. Like I like these 18 seconds. So that's what I'm going to show. Cause that's what I want to see. Mm-hmm. And, um, but yeah, there's of course, like there's, The pressure has never felt different to me between like one follower and 30,000. I don't feel like, um, I don't get nervous. I'm not like, oh, are people going to like this? Like I really feel detached from that part of it. But there's like a certain pace of like curiosity around, uh, have I done, have I done too many pop songs this week? (laughs) Because, you know, I think it's really my music choice or non-music choice that I maybe think about, but it's really a, a brief consideration and then I usually just choose whatever I want. So, yeah. Mm, great. What was the, so, so far I think we've been talking a lot about personal practice, but I know that there are other yeah. things that you do. So, um, my next question you can answer however you'd like in, in regards to whichever, whatever you like. But, um, I'm curious what drives you to do the work that you do. Hmm. You know, I think I love, I love making things. I love sharing them. I love connection. I, you know, I think what drives me is a sense of wanting to feel really alive and on and sort of connected to earth and connected to people as someone who you know, is an addict and someone who's maybe, maybe just addicted to checking out and that can look a lot of different ways. There's something about making things that brings me back into my own body and the, and the process of sharing them with other people or especially teaching or, you know, sort of real life sharing, you know, keeps me in, in a conscious state of like, I'm alive. I made Mm -hmm. it this far. I'm still Mm -hmm. here. Um, and yeah, I think for I think many people, not not to say I am more of a miracle than anyone else, but especially as someone who, you know, in the way that I used to use drugs and alcohol, my life, you know, factually should have ended so many times during that time period. So I think for me, sometimes just um, I I really feel like I'm on sort of miraculous time. So it feels like Mm. um, a responsibility maybe to myself, to my, my version of a higher power, to my greater community to sort of do, to do my work. And, and sometimes that means resting. Like I think, you know, I, I get, I get a little nervous about like productivity. Like I don't (laughs) feel like I have to keep making things to, to feel a sense of self-worth, but I do feel sort of that's sort of what drives me is yeah wanting wanting to connect to feeling alive yeah I love that do you have because I think that this is something I I work with people that are trying to get connected in their bodies as well and um, I think it is a huge missing piece of being in existence right now Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. and so i wonder if you have any specific tips for anyone in the audience that might want to get more into their bodies i think especially when feeling overwhelmed or feeling anxious or as you said uh feeling kind of drawn to to checking out um Mm -hmm. is there any advice that you would give to somebody that was in any of those states as a way to get in their body yeah absolutely i mean you know my (laughs) first my first piece of advice for myself and for everyone else is always to turn your phone off um (laughs) yeah and you know, I not, um, not don't put your phone on airplane mode. Don't put it in another room, you know, 
use the off button and we just don't use the off button. There are time, there are long periods of time where my phone is literally never off. Like it's, you know, it's always on. And so, yeah, I think for a lot of people, if they're feeling really distracted and tired, it's like your phone depletes your mind and your, phys- your adrenal glands, you know, your physical body is, is just getting depleted. So usually mm-hmm. I'm just like, turn, turn your phone off, which of course is a, um, it's scary that that is a much simpler task than it actually is. And it's mm-hmm. sort of, um, and that's what I've been sort of identifying lately in my writing and my work is like, we're all saying it. We're all saying like, social media is scary and our phones are scary, but we're not really, really, at least from what I've, I've witnessed getting into the real dirt of like, it's not just scary, it's making us sick. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really hurting our bodies and our minds. And I think, I mean, that is another kind of back to that other question. That's another thing that drives me in my work is I feel lucky that the way that I write and speak people tend to relate to it in this really extreme way where they're just like, you're saying the thing that I'm afraid to say to myself. Mm -hmm. And I think I feel really lucky that whatever gift I've been given or I'm channeling is sort of this gift of like, I'm just going to say it, even though it's scary Mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. And then it sort of like grants other people permission to look and just, you know, it's just doesn't feel as scary when you, when someone else is saying it. So I think, you know, that's, you know, my, and that's another thing that's really funny that someone asked me in an interview recently, like, oh, you're a dancer. You must be so embodied. And it's funny because again, since so much of my dancing, I record with my phone and it is, is also my art practice doesn't necessarily mean I'm actually embodied or in my body. Um, you know, I can be, it, it's sort of like if you like saw a graphic designer, like sitting at their computer and you were like, wow, you must be so embodied right now. It's like, <laughs> n- no, like that's, you know, to me sometimes dancing is the same as someone painting. It's like, it just is the medium that I work in. It doesn't, there is an inherent embodiedness to dancing. And yes, most of the time I'm very in my body when I'm dancing, but because it is or in relation to my phone, a lot of the times I'm not. So I think that's another thing is like turn off your phone and dance. Like, you know, mm-hmm. I've really been trying to rewire that my dance practice doesn't always have to be a documented, b shared, c for, l- truly for anyone, you know, it can really be, a private practice, if you will. So, mm, mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that. What, what are some things that you do to stay motivated when what you're trying to do isn't going your way or as planned? <laughs> my, fir- my first thought was I call my girlfriend. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just like, you know, I, um, or reach out to anyone who I love and who loves me. You know, I think mm-hmm. there's a real, I have a real, I have a thick support network. You know, I really, I'm not someone who, you know, I've got a sponsor, I've got a therapist, I've got an intuitive counselor, I've got two or three elder mentors. I have, you know, I have a partner, I have many close friends, I have collaborators, I have neighbors, you know, I really have, a web of people who keep me, keep Marley right sized when Mm. I start to just go totally, you know, out of my brain. And I was, you know, right before we talked, we were right before we hit record, we were talking about things that take longer than you think they will. Mm -hmm. And that to me is a huge metaphor for everything about being alive. (laughs) You know, it's like, you know, when, You turn a certain age or you're like, everybody else seems like they're at this place. And that can really, whenever I get into that space, I can really shut down. Whether it's um, thinking I'm going to, it's going to take me 20 minutes to print something and it takes me three hours or turning 30 and assuming I should have $20,000 in my savings account. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever these like milestones are, I can get really unmotivated by 
comparison to others or even just measuring my own self-worth to where I think I should be. And so I think in staying motivated, for me, it's really a like bouncing it off people who know me, who love me, who I trust to sort of see like, okay, where am I at? And finding the appropriate you know, paths for each of those, because I think what keeps me in healthy partnership or in healthy friendships is having professionals or people Mm -hmm. who like sort of hold different roles for me, you know, that, that aren't in my sort of like non-professional circle, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. I love that. Um, what is something that you are feeling really inspired by? A book, a person, a, a happening, I don't know. What's yeah. inspiring you? What is inspiring me right now? You know, I think <laughs> this is actually a surprise. Of course, my first thought was to think, like, who's the most inspiring woman in my life right now? <laughs> but I'm actually going to mention a different thing that's inspiring me today, which is... um a friend who is, or let me get less specific about it. Something that's actually inspiring me right now is men, specifically white straight men in power who are actually doing the work Mm -hmm. in their businesses or projects to dismantle their privilege in their whiteness and being cis men. So Mm -hmm. that's something that just, I just, I hung out with a friend today who, you know, has a business, he's a man, he's straight, he's white. And we were just talking about like a lot of the work he's doing in like a men's group that he's in and amongst like other male business owners. And just like any men who are doing that work and not relying on the emotional labor of women is really inspiring to me and gives me, um, some some a semblance of hope yeah so that's um there you go oh I love that I love that you shared that um Mm -hmm. because yeah I think yeah 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 I think that there (laughs) there's there work is work that needs to be done there and I think that there are men that want to do that work and are doing that work and also feeling like oh I don't know how to be right now yes and how awesome that they're turning towards each other and finding yep. productive ways to explore that. I love that. Um, I also watched the Hannah Gadsby special on Netflix last night, mm. um, which I just, it, I feel like I'm going to cry just talking about it. It's amazing. It was one of the most inspiring things I've ever seen. You know, she's a comedian, but really kind of gives this, it's a stand up special, but it's her really getting really serious about her trauma and her life, you know, as a gay woman growing up in Tasmania and just sort of like all of this, just her life and why she wants to step away from comedy and why she has sort of these more serious things to say, but she manages to go like all the way into her trauma and come all the way back out and like still make these kind of light jokes. And it's, um, yeah, that was really inspiring to me because again, it's sort of like, it's what I'm hopeful for in my own work and the kind of work that I'm drawn to is people who are sharing their whole truth without, you know, apology or a filter and presenting it in like a really beautiful sort of unedited way. Mm, Yeah, I love that. Which leads me to a question I wanted to ask you about what has been something really terrifying or risky or profound in terms of difficult decisions that you've had to make in regards to your work? Oh, yeah. You know, I just started committing to sending out a weekly email newsletter, and that has been really fun. And I, again, I did it for myself. Mm -hmm. Sorry to the few thousand subscribers. No, I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) but I, you know, I, I sort of decided, you know, I'm, I'm pretty raw and vulnerable and risky, I think in the way that I share on social media and when I teach and then when I used to have a podcast, but I think 
there was and in my zines, but I think and in my books, but I think there was still like a real time sharing that I like didn't want to quite go there on Instagram. It didn't feel like a real or safe place to be like, here's how I'm feeling about this topic. And so I was sort of like, okay, I'm going to go and do it in my newsletter. And you know, this, I think it was just last week I shared about my finances and like where Mm. I literally shared exactly how much was in my bank account that day. And, um, you know, just shared a lot about my, my process and my practice and starting to look at, you know, social media addiction, how I identify as an artist. And I've just sort of been using this weekly newsletter to sort of dip into these like hella scary places that I'm just Mm -hmm. like, I'm not going to quite show that, you know, I, I generally share things. I feel like I've already, I I sort of have like a barometer of, you know, I talk, I talk really openly about being sober and I think I'm comfortable with that because it's not something I'm like still toying. I'm not like still toying with the idea. I'm just like this, you know, Mm -hmm. this is my, my, process this was how I got here and so there's some things around like money and boundaries and like other codependency like other parts of my life that I'm like haven't really completed the process yet (laughs) and I'm like well I can't tell the people that and so I've been sort of like what if I did tell the people that and Mm -hmm. it's just I mean all I can say is the response has just been amazing like Mm -hmm. it's just been so profound to see how amazing I feel sharing those parts of myself and how much it resonates with other people so that has felt um I mean really everything I've ever done feels risky and there's been no you know I've never had a net I don't really do backup plans I don't Mm -hmm. really begin (laughs) when I'm ready I really begin before I'm ready and that for me has has served me well. It sometimes requires a little more cleaning up after, but um, Mm. it's the whole like measure twice, cut once. I kind (laughs) of cut once and measure five or six times (laughs) afterwards. Mm -hmm. But um, that, I mean, that's part of it. It's like the more that I accept that that's who I am and don't hate myself for it, I think the better, the better off I am. So, yeah. Yeah. I love well I've received your newsletter and I loved it nice. and when you did share about the finances I thought wow that's so brave <laughs> yeah. like yeah. like and and I think you even like <laughs> sur- I feel like you surfaced the things that you thought people might think in sharing that yeah um yeah. which I I love, I don't know. It just, it was, it was interesting for you to surface that. And for me Mm. to think personally, oh, I didn't think any of those things. Yeah. You know, that was a lot of people's response was like, I don't, I just didn't even think anything. I was like, oh, that's cool. And that's, you know, it's funny. Like that's what my, for the listeners, I, I did um, say I had a dollar and six cents, which was true on that day. I do have a little more than that now, but I, you know, I, (laughs) Um, you know, I feel like here's this other thing about it is I'm the only one who carries shame around that yeah. number and around the process of how I got there, how I get out of there, you know, yeah. and, you know, my partner doesn't care if I have a dollar or a million dollars, you know, my friends don't care if I have a dollar or a million dollars, they care about my like shame and joy levels. Mm -hmm, And so I think that's sort of what I've been changing is like, I have this much money. Don't worry though. Like I, I'm not worried now and how that's sort of a big, you know, you know, one might be worried at a 30 year old woman, woman having a dollar and six cents. And of course there's like, there's a lot of weird privilege wrapped up into being able to say that publicly because I also, Mm -hmm. and this is part of, you know, writing about how to not always be working as this huge topic I'm writing about is like class and privilege. And like many people have that amount of money and don't have the tools or resources or, you know, born privilege to get out of that situation. Mm -hmm. And so I also just, you know, I'm, I'm laughing, I'm light about it, but it's also like, you know, that's, I think sort of part of the reframing is of gratitude of like, I can go to these places, but I also have the ladders to climb out and not everyone has those same ladders. So I'll also say that. Yeah. Has your health ever been something that has come between you and your work? 
Yeah. It, yes. Um, the biggest thing I've probably dealt with that comes up for me about working specifically is being a person who gets migraines. Mm. And that's sort of like the number one thing that can just really stop me is, the, is I just, I'm, I'm all out for like a whole day. And if, you know, and I can't, I can't plan them. Sadly. <laughs> um, you know, I don't, I don't get a call the day before, to, you know, necessarily know if it's coming. And, but I will also report that I have made, and this is just my personal journey with migraines, but, um, I moved out of a city that was making me feel sick, just living in downtown in a city. And I moved to a rural place. And I also take fever few capsules really regularly mm -hmm. and do a couple other things. I lay on an acupressure mat and sometimes get acupuncture. I get really regular craniosacral therapy. So I'm lucky that I don't really get the kind of migraines that I used to and it's certainly not in the frequency that I have in the past mm -hmm. and it's but it's also really interesting because I a lot of my health stuff whether it's like chronic spine back stuff or my migraines nine out of t there's always a few times where I'm like this makes no sense <laughs> um, and they just feel like physical ailments that are here to kill me but a lot of the times <laughs> they are a lot of the times they are harsh little messengers and there's yeah. usually something for me that's migraines a lot of times are like unprocessed grief and really just going way too hard and fast and not pacing myself. You know, they're usually knocking me out because I'm not listening. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, my health has affected my work, but for the most part, I'm slowly been learning what it's just telling me and how to, you know, rearrange things a little bit differently. So mm, I love that this, yeah. this podcast, we both myself and my co-host are functional practitioners. So mm, we're mm -hmm. thinking about things from the very, very root cause. And we definitely consider how emotions and environmental factors and just about every experience is going to affect health in some way. Yeah. And I love what you said about these symptoms being something that is really a, a cue, a signal. It's not mm -hmm. necessarily mm -hmm. a, a war against your body, but your body yeah. is saying, hey, yo, maybe chill for a minute. Yeah. Love that. Um, you mentioned a few really awesome self-care practices to help mm. you. Um, I wonder if there's anything that you'd like to add or anything that you consider to be a non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my non-negotiable, I, hmm, my non-negotiable shift a little bit sometimes, but I try like the negotiation of the non-negotiables, if, <laughs> if you will, has to just be mindful. Like that's the rule. Like if I'm like, okay, this non-negotiable is not serving me anymore. Let's take it off the list. But, um, you know, praying every day is a non-negotiable for me. Thanking the universe for another day of being alive is a, is a non-negotiable. And Generally, doing my morning pages is a non-negotiable. I say generally because I did kind of go into this phase where, like, it wasn't really helpful for me to, like, start thinking right away in the morning. <laughs> it was, like, better, you know, it was just healthier for me to, like, go for a walk instead or, like, do other tasks. Um, no phone in the morning, you know, no scrolling in bed. Mm -hmm. Um and, and if, I would like to just be as, you know, transparent as possible that these rules – get constantly broken. You know, I call them non-negotiables mm -hmm. and they get broken. And I think what's healthy about for me calling them non-negotiables is like giving my permission to always sort of start over. And um there is in if anybody's a 12 a 12 stepper whether you're like Alanon, AA, NA, mm -hmm. OA, DA, mm -hmm. all of them. Um <laughs> you know the 11th there's this part in some of the literature about the 11th step which is, you know, we have this 
conscious, we continue to like practice prayer and meditation in our lives. And there's this part in some of the literature that's like, it doesn't say, it doesn't say if, but it says when you mm. get off track in your practice of daily prayer. Mm. It just says resume mm-hmm. prayer. <laughs> and I, I love that because it doesn't say like, you know, if you get off track, hate yourself for like mm. three days you know, chain smoke, drink a beer, <laughs> and then maybe start again. You know, it's it's like just fucking start over, like just start again. And we yeah. spend, you know, when we have these self-care rituals and these non-negotiables, like we, oh, I haven't met anybody yet who hasn't fallen off the beam a little bit. Right. And so once we're just like, okay, we're, we're just, we're going to get off whatever our daily or monthly or whatever our non-negotiable is. And, and the, sh- the shorter we can get the self-hatred time, the better. Cause that's where I think the shame of self-discipline happens is like, I, mm-hmm. I'm definitely an undisciplined person. So I try to put these things in my life to help me stay disciplined. But what really keeps me undisciplined is the shame <laughs> of being undisciplined. <laughs> and so I think the more I can sort of like, Ding, ding, ding. Um, I mean, another self-care thing I've been thinking a lot about too is like, instead of self-care is like, what can help my self-esteem? Because like, I can run myself a bath and hate myself, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, I'd be like, oh, I'm making a bath because I fucking hate myself and I'm, I have to because I've got to fix myself. And so mm, thinking more yeah. about like, okay, what makes me feel really good about myself? Like, calling someone I've been meaning to call, taking out the trash, like making my bed, like really mundane things are also for me, really important self care Mm -hmm. practices that just sort of keep me in the like, really simple parts of humanness that sometimes my grandiose parts of my ego wants to like, shoot really far out instead of just being like, okay, I have like normal human adult things to do. So Mm -hmm. those are sort of help helpful self care is to look at like, how's my self esteem and what's affecting it right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love those very simple practices. I love that you said bed, like making your bed because I just feel like that can make such a big difference and it's so accessible. Yes. Yes. Because I think this has come up a couple times in this conversation, but, um, you know, self-care sometimes, some of the ways that it is illustrated can be not for everyone. People, yeah. not everyone would necessarily yeah. have time to devote in such a way, but I love that shift of what are the things yeah. that make me feel, feel good yeah. that I can do. Beautiful. <sighs> How do you play every day? You know, personal practice as a project really is playing every day. You know, I I don't really think of it that way and don't really use the word play a lot. But I think that that is really a big part of my life is it's, you know, a lot of times it is. It, it's not always playful. Like sometimes it is serious, but like I think the more I let myself play on it, it's fun. It's mm-hmm. like I don't have to take it so seriously. Like there's other forms and mediums of my life that um, I, you know, and I think part of it is I take my work really seriously, but I don't take myself really seriously, which I think helps me just stay and play like all the time. Like I can talk about my really serious zine I just wrote in a playful way. You know, I think there's like, I present things playfully that are serious in some ways. Um, I also just like, I feel really lucky to, for the most part in the last 15 years of my life, have always been with partners who are really playful Mm. and friends who are really playful. Like I love just being with my friends and with my partner and like laughing and like just choosing joy and um, swimming keeps me playful. I love to swim. Mm. Um, Makes me feel like a little seal, you know, Mm. makes me feel like a little creature. (laughs) Um, So yeah, I think like 
fringe relationships being fun is really important to me. And, um, yeah, that's some of how I play. Awesome. I love, (laughs) I love swimming and thinking of an animal, like thinking of yourself as a small animal and shifting the, the perspective in some ways. I know when I feel really small, Like being in a body of water, being in a forest or on a cliff or something like that. I'm like, wow, I'm tiny. And that just is so, that's a wonderful feeling. I'm not sure if it's play, but it definitely feels joyful for me. Yeah, I live in a very small cabin in a grove of eucalyptus trees that surround it in a circle. And oh, I know, so I know, I know it is. It's very shady. My house gets very dark, but sometimes I, cause even when I'm in my house and next to them, you know, I don't, I can't see myself really. Like I know they're big, but sometimes I will just film myself. I think I did share a video recently of me dancing by them, but I'll, I'll just take a selfie basically like a time selfie mm. just to see myself next to them. Yeah. to remind myself how small I am. They are so tall. I mean, I also live very close to many redwoods, yeah. but I'm, you know, specifically surrounded by these like very tall eucalyptus trees that um it's very it's kind of back to that like feeling right-sized um yeah. phrase. It's just I'm like, great. Um this is this is how small Marley is in the scheme of all of it. Great. Mm. Glad glad to know it. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, what are, well, so what are some tricks or hacks maybe that you've discovered that keep you focused and productive when you need to be? Turning my phone off again. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Is, uh, yeah. When I think about getting distracted, literally, I'm just like, it's just my phone phone and after that I'm fine you know I also really think (laughs) a lot about like setting myself up well for work and I was thinking about how yesterday thinking about like all these things kept going wrong and it felt like it took me so long and then by the time I got home I was like oh I haven't like eaten it was like 5 Mm. p.m. and I was like oh I haven't like eaten a meal yet or like had a glass of water that wasn't a LaCroix or you know it's like I think when I know I'm going to go into a hard work day to just be realistic about like have pack a granola bar, like have your water bottle. Like, and it's funny. I remember telling my dad once I was like, dad, I really notice when I drink a lot of water, I'm really good at working. <laughs> and my dad, my dad was like, Marley, you know, drinking water is just a requirement for being alive. And I was like, <laughs> damn, like, Okay. Like, you know, I have, I'm like suggesting these things for like better productivity and it's like, nope, just, uh, eating and drinking water requirements for not passing out. You know, it's like, it's really (laughs) funny how much I can just go on the adrenaline of being a Gemini who drinks a lot of coffee in the morning. I'm just like, here we go. I got ideas. I'm going. And then all of a sudden 5 PM comes around and I'm like, why do I hate myself? Why do I feel so crazy? And it's like, well, because you like haven't eaten or stretched. And so I think like really building in food, water, like (laughs) just being like, what are the basic survival needs for today and not skipping them because you're like, I just have so much work to do. It's like, no, you still have to like do all the human requirements for your body. And (laughs) and so those are my... (laughs) Oh, those are my things. And, um, and yeah, just, you know, keeping my phone, keeping my phone off or away and, um, um, lists, you know, I'm a big, just, I have to, you know, I know there's so many like internet tools for better interneting, but, um, I just really love a good clipboard and a pen personally, Mm -hmm. you know, and really like, you know, I run a, I have a public studio where I live and I really have been trying to like, when I walk in, I just want to start. Like I just want to start and really trying to stop myself and really write down, like pour yourself water today, like open Mm -hmm. the mail, send this email, like really, really specific 
not even because I want to cross it off, but just to slow myself down to really look at like, okay, what's each task that actually has to get done today? Because I think that was another part of my like yesterday is like everything's taking longer is I like never really clearly looked at how much actually had to get done. Mm -hmm. I was just like print a zine, but I forgot I had to like (laughs) edit edit the zine and lay out the zine and and get the ink for the print you know it's like you know print zine has many other things that come before it so yes yes that was this that was totally my situation today too before we get on the call I was sharing how I'm having one of those (laughs) days today and yeah it was like oh yeah make this thing but then also collect all the photos for this thing and create the the copy pieces and oh yeah you need a filter and oh you didn't download that font and it's just like yeah yeah yes Anyway. anyway yeah i love i love that um yeah and i think that these basic human the basics of being a human and staying alive really I think right now are <laughs> hacks <laughs> like the yeah, eating yeah. the drinking water the taking a breath like taking a moment to yeah. breathe they're very small things that have a very uh deep impact when done yes. regularly yes thank yes. you for that reminder yes. um how about a few blogs or podcasts that you just love that you can't imagine your day without and why? Um, I love the, okay. I love ideal futures podcasts by Sarah Godestiner and Mm. Gina Young. Um, I think it's amazing. I think they pick incredible guests and are incredible interviewers and I love listening to them and they're both geniuses. And I, also love my favorite murder. Mm-hmm. It's uh, just, it's just good. It's just good. I think that Karen and Georgia, the hosts, do an amazing job. Um, you know, t- talking about this thing, the death, ba- murder, basically that people are like kind of scared that they're into hearing about or something, and they also just use their platform to talk about a lot of other really serious things. And um, yeah, those are two podcasts that I listen to. I don't, I'm not really much of a podcast listener, which um, I'm a little bit more of an audiobook listener. Mm. Um, but yeah, those are two podcasts that um, stick out to me. And then I don't know if this is really a, um, it's not really a blog, but I've been really inspired by and enjoying this woman Rachel Cargill, and I'm not 100% sure if that's how you pronounce her name, but that's um, how it's spelled. And she's been doing this, like, email challenge called Unpacking White Feminism, and she's been doing it as um, as a lecture. And she's a black woman who does not owe us this emotional labor, but has done this really amazing job sort of crafting this way of sharing and talking about it and posing questions. And so I've just really been enjoying reading her writing and and getting her prompts in my email inbox for the last few days it's happening this month and i think anyone can still sign up for it started on the first of um july but yeah i've it's been you know she asks asks questions that are definitely um hard and triggering and amazing for me to look at to really look inward to see where you know what is just in my body that I don't even realize is there. Mm. And so, yeah, those are a few, few Great. things that I've been thinking about. Yeah. Great. We'll link to those in the show notes. If anybody's interested. Great. Awesome. If you had a little bit of magic in your pocket, what is one thing that you would love to change in the world? Wow, I'd love to redistribute all of the wealth (laughs) and give it to people of color and women and trans women and everyone who's marginalized and take it out of the hands of wealthy, rich white men. (laughs) That's Mm -hmm. the thing I would change. I think that's just like the one... (laughs) There's so many things that I, you know, obviously (laughs) could change, but I just feel like that is like, 
part of why I do my job is to do my best to redistribute that that money and where it where it goes and where it comes from and um just something I've been thinking a lot about is like what would it look like if those weren't the people who had all the all mm-hmm. the money um I just kind of feel like that would be such a ripple effect for mm-hmm. everything else. So yeah, it's like a bit of magic to actually make it happen. But then I think there's certain ways I've seen people in my life making money and redistributing that money, and whether it's in their small business or in different nonprofits or projects that they're doing where it is, I think possible. You know, mm-hmm. I, I mean, that's part of why I love Sarah and Gina's name for their podcast is Ideal Futures. I mean, that's what, you know, I look at Sarah and the way she runs her business and it's really kind of in that same vision of like how, what she, she's really transparent about what she does with the money she makes and where she puts it. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, that's, and that is magic to me. Like that's what, what Mm -hmm. casting, you know, spells is about. So yeah, that's, that's what I would do with a little magic in my pocket and what I hope to be doing, you know, in my work in the world. Mm, awesome I love that you don't even have to have literal magic in your pocket you can do no. that you can do it right now every everyday magic you know yeah. real magic wonderful what is your current project or passion that you'd like to share with the audience um well I just self-published a zine that came out this week mm-hmm. so I guess that's my current project and I'm working on teaching a workshop around it at other wild in LA next week. And the zine is called the zine. I love this. It's called <laughs> how a photo and video sharing social networking service gave me my best friends, true love, a beautiful career and made me want to die. Mm. So, um, it's, you know, it, and then the inside I say, you know, it's an essay about offline practice and social media boundaries. So it's sort of, it's funny cause I have, I have a book coming out in the fall that's a full version of the zine, How to Not Always Be Working. And this sort of feels like um, in con- in conjunction a little bit. It's sort of like a almost like another precursor. Like mm-hmm. it's sort of like here's more words that I need to like share now. And and the book sort of holds more of, of you know, exercises and things to work through. But um, yeah, I think... And then I'm, and then I opened this new space here, um, center and that's, and it's my, my public studio and a space for creative practice and the community here. And yeah, those are the like kind of two big things I'm working on right now are like how to activate that space. And also like, I think maybe another thing I'm really working on is like how to be rooted, but malleable and certainly like Mm. my I'm in a relationship right now where my girlfriend lives in LA and I live like an hour north of San Francisco and sort of like sinking into this nice flow of like how do I stay really rooted with how my life is in West Marin and at center and feel like I can pick up and go to LA when I want to and sort of get this activation of like city life and come back to rural life. Mm. And so that's maybe my like personal project. Mm -hmm. And I I can report it's going well. And it just, I think in some ways it takes practice and clunky parts of like figuring out how you want it to look. But I'm sort of enjoying this sort of like cross California life Mm -hmm. that's emerging (laughs) for me a little bit right now. It's been um, fun to sort of see how how it shows up in my like workflow and self-care flow to, you know, not always be in my quote home. That is my home here. So, mm, yeah. yeah, I like the curiosity that you're bringing to that yes. exploration yes. too. That to everything really right healthy. now. That's really what the yeah. project is, is curiosity to everything. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything that I didn't ask you that you would like to share with the audience? I don't think so. I think you did a great job. You just, Mm. I think, I think we covered, I think we covered it. Cool. And so how can our audience find you and find your books and all that good stuff if they want to know more? Yeah. If you want to follow along on the video and 
photo social networking <laughs> service. Um, my handle is Marley Grace, my name. And then you can also watch personal practice videos at personal practice. And then my website is just marleygrace.space. And if you go to marleygrace.space slash home, there is a link to everything. There's a link mm, yes. to all my workshops that are coming up and pre-ordering how to not always be working and ordering my zine and going to center's online shop. It's just, I'll put a link to this podcast recording when it comes out. It's just all the links, baby. Great. And you do work with people one-on-one. I do. I yeah. do. I have, I have a practice of creative advice where I hang out with people for an hour on the phone or you can come to Center and in Inverness. Um, and I'm also working on an advice column that is mm. to be read in your mail and from the USPS. So you can also send me mail at P.O. Box 123, Point Ray Station, California, 94956. So lots, lots of ways to be in touch. Wonderful. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much, Marley. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was very fun. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And there you have it. I hope you gleaned some creative inspiration and motivation from this interview. Definitely catch Marley on her social media channels to stay up to date on her creative evolution. Next week, we are flipping the tables a bit and doing an interactive question and answer session where we'll be providing some playful self-inquiry with uh, some writing writing and visualization exercises for you to either start or continue your personal creative practice. So be sure to tune in. And if you haven't already, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. We love reading them and it also helps us reach more women like you. So thanks so much. Have a great rest of your week. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to Females and Fine Fettle from Wiped Out to Wealthy, a podcast to fit your lifestyle. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe, rate, and review at femalesandfinefettle.com. If you have questions or topic ideas for upcoming episodes, we'd love to hear from you. Please be sure to tune in next week.